We read the Word of God as we find it recorded in the familiar words of the Luke chapter 2. Luke 2. Our attention is to focus on the 10th verse this morning, Luke 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us, go, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. We stop in our reading of the Word of God at that point. May he bless his word to our hearts. Verse 10, Luke 10, verse ten. Luke 2, verse 10, is our text. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. The angel himself reflecting Verse 9 tells us the glory of the Lord himself, communicating that glory, brought, he declared, good tidings, news, good news, of the greatest joy to the shepherds. Our prayer, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will be able, and he is able, of that there's no doubt, 
but that he will communicate that kind of joy this morning. So that you don't hear the messenger, but you hear the message. And that he is able to communicate to every one of us, we pray, that greatest of all joys. You have a Savior. He's the Messiah. And you call him your Lord and your God. Fear not, I bring you good tidings of great joy. First of all, briefly, the setting, which is a frightening setting. Then, secondly, a joyful message. A joyful message in that frightening setting. And then we'll conclude with the fearless no longer fear, afraid, the fearless recipients unto you. Good tidings of great joy to all. Let's consider that prayerfully. The shepherds are normally in that day very young teenagers. 11, 12, maybe up to 16 years old. That's all. And now listen to the, what they actually did and how they thought. Just young boys. Not boys that we would say, well, you can't expect much from them. God expected a lot. And he had already worked in them because even though if they were the normal, they were the youngest in the family, they were uneducated, they didn't go to schools, they didn't have a lot of head knowledge. But it is obvious that they had the gift of faith. They had been gifted by God with faith because that the messenger would come to them with this good tidings and that they were able to grasp it so that they left their responsibilities, the sheep, in order to see what it was that had been told them. And then, even though they saw a baby, just a baby, wrapped up in rags and lying in a feeding trough, they had the faith to believe that what they had been told about that baby was accurate. A Savior. The Messiah. It was normal for them during the day, to go their separate ways, to take their flocks into that rocky areas in, in order to find the tufts of grass for the small flocks of sheep that they were responsible for. But then at night, so that they could find rest, there were different places where they had, over the decades and centuries, used to gather where there was fences made out of various things so that they could enclose the sheep all together overnight so that a few could watch or take turns watching, but they could rest and sleep and prepare for the next day. Don't ever forget this either, that these young men these young boys took the news and they not only told as many of those who were of like-minded as them, but they went back to their sheep. 
they didn't count themselves to be gifted and qualified now to change their occupation. They went back and they watched their sheep. They went back to their homes, hearts overwhelmed. But they went back, and there's where they lived out their recipients, that joy of great, that joy that God had given to them and the knowledge that they had a Savior. What time of the day or night it was, we don't know. Likely evening, because they had gathered together. How deep or dark the night was is unknown. Whether they were still chatting around a fire quietly, or whether they had actually fallen asleep already, that too, unknown. But in the midst of that darkness of night, they're suddenly not just startled, but something far stronger than that when suddenly this angel appears before them. The angel in his very person possessed not just angelic glory, but the glory of the Lord, the glory of God himself. Blinded and afraid. That glory of God brought the brilliance of the holy, perfect God that when Jesus comes again with that kind of glory, it'll envelop the whole of the universe. Sometimes we can wonder whether that angel only in his person shone with the glory or whether he brought a glory that glowed all around them and they were surrounded with glory. Startled by it. Afraid. Habakkuk uses this language that God is a God whose eyes are too pure to behold evil. That God gave His glory, a glory that's too pure to behold evil, right there in front of those young men. And that's why they were afraid. The King James uses sore afraid. The original uses the word mega fear. They were extremely afraid. Now, you can be startled by somebody in the more in the daylight and it scares you and you scream. But when in the middle of the night they get this startled light it's more than just the appearance of something that they don't know, that they've never seen before. And it's more than just some blinding brilliance. Now remember who these shepherds are. Young though they may have been, they had a faith that God had given to them. And if you have faith, you not only believe the promises of the Word of God, but you also believe what that Word of God says about you. And so here comes that brilliant light reflecting the holiness of the God whose eyes are too pure to behold evil. And again, not just something that they've never seen before or something so dazzling that they hardly can look at it, but this is the glory of a holy God and their fear was that they were going to die. Now, not just have their life ended, but they were going to die in the sense that they were going to be judged and condemned by that holy God. They saw themselves. Faith shows us our sin and our sinfulness. 
And it was as if they stood before God in all of his glory naked with the eyes of God able to penetrate their soul. They saw their sinfulness at that moment like never before. And their great fear, their mega fear, was that they knew themselves to be worthy of hell. That, that's the kind of fear that they had. Given faith and the glory of the Lord, you put those two together and you come up with a terror of hell. So the first thing that the angel says is fear not. Tender, loving, the father, the shepherd, communicating to his children who are afraid. Just, just like our children can be afraid of the dark or scared by something. And the parent comes and embraces them and, and, and just with their presence envelops them and speaks quietly and calmly. It's okay. Don't be afraid. Fear not. God, whose glory was making them afraid, now communicates to them that they need not fear. And the reason why is given. Look! Behold! Don't miss that little word. Behold! Catch this thought. Look at this. Don't look at my glory. Don't be, be dazzled by what a brilliant thing it is. Now forget what you see and listen. Because I am going to bring you good tidings of great joy. Now, here's where we want to stop a minute and reflect what we've been hearing on the radio, television, Facebook, all kinds of other messages. What you hear in the papers, you read it today. What kind of good news is communicated to us today? There are men who are going to try to get your vote to be president, just as they have in the past, and they like to present themselves as saviors. They'll take away your reason for being afraid of Muslims. They'll build a wall. They'll stop crime. They'll in lower the level of liter or increase the level of literacy. They'll lower the levels of poverty. And and we can as a nation buy into that because we begin to think that that would be great. That's good news. And so what happens is this inner fear of meeting our maker that resides in every man because the work of the law is written in their heart and they know they will have to meet their maker and that fear of meeting their maker is calmed and quieted by temporary distractions. It's, it's like hiding the greatest gift under a pile of earthly presents. But increasing literacy educating everybody, giving free college education to everybody on the poverty level or 
relieving everybody of poverty does not remove the kind of fear that the shepherd boys had. And it doesn't remove the fear of anyone who stands before the realization that they have to give an accounting to their maker. And to every child of God who knows that his that that relationship that he's been gifted to have so that he is privileged to be called a child of God and may call God his father knows that the sins and sinfulness that are his far exceeds that of those who are not God's children. And our reason at times to have fear is so great. Some of us have been raised in those sorts of atmospheres where all we see is, look at how horrible of a sinner I still am. How could I ever be saved? And to talk about literacy and riches and relief from crime doesn't take away that greatest of all fears. I have to meet my maker. I have to give an answer. I know better. And I still sin. And then he comes with all of his glory, his brilliance, And I'm afraid. I'm sore afraid. The good news, the great news of great joy is that there is born to us this day in the city of David the Savior. The Savior who doesn't Deliver me from my circumstances. Those boys were still uneducated. And they still were the youngest in the family, given the lousiest job of having to watch over sheep. And they had to go back and take care of them. They weren't delivered from their circumstances. In fact, in fact, the sign that was given to them showed no relief from the earthly circumstances because they had to see this Savior as a baby in rags in a manger. What kind of a Savior from earthly circumstances could He be? So, no... Nothing was going to change as far as their earthly circumstances are concerned. They still were going to be facing headaches. They were still going to be facing all kinds of diseases. They still could be faced with cancer. They were still going to have their arthritis. They were still going to have their poverty. They still were going to have their difficulties in this life. They were still going to be fighting against that greatest of all enemies, Satan himself and sin. And they would have to fight and fight and fight, weary and heavy laden. Nothing outwardly was going to change. But something inward was given to them. Joy comes from inside. Joy is something that God implants in an understanding that is able to grasp and fill the soul. Good tidings of great joy, dread from divine wrath, is answered only by one thing. The dread of divine wrath is answered by a Savior. Who paid 
So his poverty, his humility, beginning at the manger, through his life he had no place where to lay his head. The foxes have their holes. The Savior had no place where to lay his head. The clothes and the garments that he wore were given to him out of pity and then ripped off his body as he was nailed to the cross. But it was there on the cross that he paid. And the nature of his payment was that he gave us deliverance from the greatest evils. And he brought us into the greatest joy. Because by doing all of that humility, the manger, the swaddling clothes, no place to lay his head, borrowed clothes, ripped from him naked and willingly dying, he did out of love. And that's how he earned earned sufficient righteousness to cover the sins of as many people as the stars of the heaven and the sands on the seashore. News of great joy? My sins are gone. I'm forgiven. I'll not forget a mother reporting once that her child came from catechism class where there was an incident or two that required the catechumen to say, as he's been taught, I'm sorry. So all of a sudden, these wiggly first, second, and third graders are silenced because they know somebody's in trouble. But they've learned. Do you have anything to say? I'm sorry. Anything else? Please forgive me. Gone! Forgiven! It's all done. Gone. I don't remember it anymore. So the catechumen gets in the car and says, Mom, I learned about forgiveness. Well, what is forgiveness? It's gone! Now get a hold of what it is to be a sinner and to hear him say, it's gone. And you can look and stand before those eyes that are too pure to behold evil and you can stand there. And he'll say to you, don't be afraid. I welcome you into my light. I give you that light. And we want to say, but, but I, I'm still a sinner. And his answer every time is, I don't remember. What are you talking about? They're gone. So that Nathan amazingly could say to David 1,500 years before Jesus died, Jehovah hath put away thy sin. Not just in this dispensation may we say that, but then too, forgiven. Totally and completely forgiven. So gone that it's not like a diamond dropped into 2,000 feet of ocean water. It's still there somewhere. No, God says gone. Completely. That's the joy. So that the, the concept of the final judgment and our, lead, our being laid naked before him and everyone is no longer a reason for fear. But as the catechumens know, the language of the Belgian Confession most desirable and comfortable. 
So we can say, come, Lord Jesus, I want to go through that judgment day because I want to learn again the good tidings of great joy where I can hear not only mine, but the sins of all of thy people are gone. That's joy. Great joy. The angel said, this shall be to all people. It's universal. That first. Not every people, every person, but to all kinds of people. The Pharisees were saying to the shepherd boys and their parents, you got to be a Pharisee. You've got to be good enough. You've got to have done this and this. And, and you better not have done this. And John the Baptist came with the message out of the wilderness. And he said, no, I'm not going to preach in Jerusalem next to those Pharisees. I'm going to preach here in the wilderness next to the Jordan River. And I'm going to come in the spirit of Elijah. And I want you to know. You don't have to be good enough because you can't be good enough ever. But I'm going to make you good. I've made you good. Even if you're just a shepherd, illiterate, stinky, dirty with the sheep, and you got to go back to it. So here you are. And it doesn't change our earthly circumstances. But we can hear all kinds of people. Males and females. Slaves and free. Rich and poor. Out of every nation. The elect out of every nation even the lowly and insignificant of society, may hear the angels say, good news of great tidings, of great joy, universal. And this is why I pointed out in Psalter number 55, very personal, so that it's the next verse to you. And he points to you is born a Savior of your sins, all of them. Directly he speaks to you. Hear, hear him tell you. Maybe news you've heard all kinds throughout your whole life. But may we hear it afresh today. And may it sink into our understanding and into our hearts. Joy that comes to the contrite and to the humble. To the weary and the heavy laden. And hear him tell you. Fear not. What time I am afraid, I put my trust in thee. No joy, beloved, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Joy is yours. The greatest joy. Amen. Thanks. Father, thanks, great shepherd. Thanks for giving to us. And may each one of us say me to know the forgiveness so that I don't have to be afraid, not of thee and not of the judgment, and I can stand in that brilliant light of thy glory, unafraid. 
for Jesus' sake, amen.